Welcome to The Troublesome Terps, the podcast about things that keep interpreters up at night. Um, here in our virtual studio, we have some of the usual suspects, uh, our most famous author, researcher, and the guy who always has something to say, Jonathan Downey. <laughs> I'm not sure which bit of the intro to contradict first. No, it's actually really good to be back. It's it's good to to get back in the saddle and do recording some more episodes. And of course, Troublesome Terps would not exist without our editor extraordinaire, by far the most famous of the, the hosts, actually, the man who knows more about tablets than Moses, Alexander Drexel. Oh wow, we're going all in with the stakes right now. But thanks, it's it's great uh, talking to you. And um, Sarah just said that we have almost everyone on board because um, Alex G cannot join us tonight. He's just back from a big trip and still very much jet lagged, so he's excused for the night. But to compensate for that, we have a very special guest for us because today we want to talk about linguistics once more and why linguistics is cool and everybody should care about it. Um, introducing Lauren Gorn. Welcome to the show, Lauren. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me, and I am so excited to talk about linguistics. <laughs> yes. Me too. <laughs> That's a sentence that not many people utter. <laughs> That's right, but it's actually a sentence that you would hear very often if you've ever listened to Lingthusiasm before, which is uh, Lauren's podcast, which she does with Gretchen McCulloch, the Internet's resident linguist. Um, so she's very lingthusiastic. We'll, we'll get to the podcast as well, but first of all, um, Lauren, you uh, have a PhD in linguistics and you teach linguistics. So w would you describe yourself as a, as a linguist, as a scholar? What's, what, do you, what do you tell people you do when you meet them at a party? I tell them I'm a linguist first and foremost because I, as you said, I do teach and research and with the podcast I'm also really enthusiastic. I'm going to use that word too much now. I'm also really interested in um, introducing people to what linguistics is and how it can be useful across a whole range of areas. So technically at the moment I'm a lecturer in linguistics, um, but of course in a university, you're never just one thing. And I wear many hats, but all of those hats tend to say linguist on them. <laughs> That's a cool hat. I, I want one of those too. <laughs> <laughs> but um, maybe just to say that we're recording this in January 2020, depending on when you're listening to this. And uh, Lauren's based in Australia, and um, there are some big fires going on um, at the moment. And Lauren has a very cool initiative. I don't know, do you, do you want to tell us about that real quick before we get into a uh, the rest of the show because you have uh, you're taking part in an initiative to support um, the firefighters and to raise money. Do you yeah, want to tell us about sure. that? Sure. So um, we've had bushfires. Uh, we have bushfires in Australia that are regularly. They're a natural phenomenon. They're part of how the land has been managed by Indigenous Australians for tens of thousands of years. But uh, this year's fires are particularly extreme. That's for a whole number of reasons. One of those, first and foremost, being climate change, um, some general mismanagement that's let them get too dry for too long, some drought. Uh, so it's really unprecedentedly catastrophic in terms of the scale of the destruction um, across large areas of Australia. And I think also the thing that's really driven at home for a lot of people is that we've been having smoke inundation in major cities. So I actually, I was this morning, I was like, I'm coming down with a cold. And I just realized it's actually just because we've had bushfire smoke blowing through Melbourne for the last few days. Uh, so it's very hard to ignore uh, the situation. It's incredibly stressful. Um, I have people I know, uh, you know, fighting for their homes or volunteering with the fire service. Um, so uh, around that, it, it's hard to feel very helpful when you kind of live in a city and you're very far from the, the bushfires. But um, there's this amazing initiative. Um, Emily Gale and some other colleagues have put together called Authors for Fireys, which was a Twitter auction, which is not something I'd ever heard of before, really. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it is um, individual, like there's no kind of central organization. It's just if you have something as an author that you can auction um, to raise money for the firefighters, um, which is why it's called auction uh, authors for fireies, because Australians love shortening any words they where do, possible. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, I I work with a lot of um, authors, and 
I can't obviously care about this situation that's happening. Um, so I uh, I put up for auction the opportunity uh, to work with me on your project. So I would construct a language um, for someone's project, um, which is a thing I like to do. I've done with authors before. It's super fun. Um, and uh, yeah, it was very exciting. Wow. It's it's funny because I always thought that when I because usually it's just referred to as con language and I always thought okay is, is this is this to trick people somehow but it actually just <laughs> short for constructed language <laughs> um, so yeah that's but that's that's a pretty cool that's a pretty cool project um, and and do you have a winner now can can you say more about that or is that yeah I do yeah so uh, the winning bid was from L J Charleston who is a Y A young adult author. Um, they won with a six hundred and sixty dollar bid, so that's an amazing donation to um, the the fire service. And um, yeah, we already we're already scheming, and it's already very exciting. And uh, so it's uh, you know obviously constructing a language is not going to help uh, immediately uh, deal with the the fire, but it's nice to be able to participate in something where you feel at least this kind of sense of community and a sense of everyone kind of raising money together to deal with the situation. Of course, it would just be easier if we taxed people and implemented sustainable fire policies. Oh, well. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, with that option off the table, apparently, here That's we That's a go. different podcast, yeah. 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 I remember chatting, I got the, the opportunity to chat to David Peterson, who wrote the constructed languages for some of the Game of Thrones and things like that. And... Um, the amount of work that goes into a constructed language and the amount of knowledge that you have to have to be able to do it well, that's an, an incredible thing talking of. I'm, I'm, I just looked up Authors for Friday's Aid and I was amazed at the amount of work and the amount of heart that people are being able to put into things that are auctioning off it. That is absolutely fantastic. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, David Peterson has an incredibly thoughtful approach to constructing languages that kind of constructs a whole history of the language um, and I always really admire his work mm. and Laura would you say this is kind of the holy grail for a linguist because I mean being a linguist means sort of deconstructing language in a way and then seeing how it works and how people use it and then sort of making one up yourself is that sort of I, I imagine it to be very very difficult I don't know it relies on a very similar set of skills, and I use a lot of the same kind of data management tools that I use in language documentation. So in my day job, uh, one of the kind of principal areas of research I do is in the field of language documentation. Mm. So I work on documenting and describing um, this series of Tibetan varieties that are spoken in Nepal. Mm -hmm. And um, in some ways... Uh, they, they draw on similar skills. I'm looking at similar features of the language from the sounds all the way up to the words and then the sentences. Um, and I kind of approach, you know, managing a dictionary the same way for those, uh, whether it's a language I construct or one I'm documenting. But, um, you know, there's something strangely despotic about sitting in a room by yourself and being the boss of a whole language. Yeah. Uh, whereas I really love spending time with people, hearing their stories mm. and, um, you know, kind of trying to make sense for myself of the grammar of these languages um, and kind of figure out what's happening. So uh, they're both satisfying but in slightly different ways. That's something that's really impressed me is that the more linguists that I meet, even the kind of hardcore uh, computational linguists it seems to be far more away in this in linguistics now that a language isn't just a set of rules and a set of phonemes. There's there's something about history, there's something about culture, there's something about the people that seems to be kind of bred into the, that, that seems to be carried across and bred into the languages. And it's been really heartening to see that because when I was training as a translator and interpreter, text linguistics was one of the things that we had to learn, and there was seemed to be a fight then between the people who were like, well, we just analyze the text as if it was a decontextualized piece of text. And the people who said, no, text means something. The, the, they're meaningful to people, and we need to understand that. And it seems to be the more linguists I meet, the more people are saying, yeah, actually, language is about people. It's not just about you know a set of black and white rules on a piece of paper somewhere. 
Yeah, there are different flavours of linguistics. Yeah. Sarah, you probably encountered this as well, Sarah, in your training. 100%. I was just going to say, correct me if I'm wrong, or maybe that's just my uh, conception, but I would argue that linguistics is all about people. It's all people and languages, because in the end, language is there for people to express themselves, right? So it's entirely based on how like the way people are the way they think the way their culture is and develop the history behind it which is exactly what to me makes it so fascinating because there's so much more in it than just a set of rules and that was the tradition that i was trained in as well to think about language as it's used as well as this kind of abstracted that there is something very interesting and something very compelling about the fact that you can have all of these humans who somehow converge on this set of norms that you can kind of abstract into rules. Yeah. Um, and, the, you know, there are people who work in areas like syntax who are very interested in kind of figuring out what these rules are, and I admire them greatly for it, but I'm really <laughs> interested in the, the messy, you know, we talk about the messy bits of language, and this is where, you know, I, I love that it kind of tickles the science part of my brain but it also keeps me really grounded in the kind of humanistic humanities uh, area that I trained in. And so, um, yeah, I think ignoring either of those is... Yes, I remember, sorry, when I was studying linguistics for my bachelor's degree, I I took a bunch of courses, but one of them um, was child language acquisition as well, which which was really fascinating. And I remember my teacher asking us in one of the... Um, sessions uh, what is grammar and everyone was like Ooh. oh it's a set of rules la 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 and she was like no it's how people see the world you see like I don't know the that bird flies to that tree you know just to, mm. super simple now but just like this does that and from there it goes so it was for me it, yeah it was so simple but it completely changed my view uh, on something like grammar for example <laughs> And it's been amazing. There seems to have been a bit of a renaissance recently. I mean, we always knew that linguistics and language was cool, but I noticed with uh, Gretchen Star Rising and then Tom Scott, who's done some amazing videos on YouTube, that linguistics is becoming a cool thing. That even people who normally wouldn't have touched languages at, at school, the, the comments on YouTube are like, oh, I didn't realize that English was the only language that did this, or I didn't realize that other languages. And suddenly people's awareness that the world is bigger than just white middle class English is really heartening to see. It's really exciting that, um, you know, one of the reasons, one of the many reasons I love linguistics is that it's a vehicle for understanding the world and your place in it. And um, we're kind of taught, unfortunately, in a lot of education systems to be wary of grammar or it's imposed upon us, but we actually carry a lot of knowledge and understanding with us and so kind of teasing out what people already know intuitively is is really rewarding but uh, as a question to to you lauren and and to to everyone actually is the this sort of interest that you see or renewed interest in linguistics um what role do you see there for descriptivists and prescriptivists i mean is this interest in linguists more about people wanting their sort of sticklerisms confirmed or is it really sort of curiosity about um, how language works and how people use it? Is that because it seems to me sometimes that a lot of people are interested in linguistics because they think, you know, the Oxford comma is a question of life and death and that kind of thing. So I, I'm, just one, I'm just interested in your take on that, actually. One of the things I really enjoy about this current right wave of descriptive linguistics that, you know, Gretchen does and you see Ben Zimmer writing about and a lot of the kind of current podcasts is that this old kind of concept of the war between descriptivists and prescriptivists and the old battles over, you know, the function of the dictionary, they still surface and we're still educating people about why it's important to observe language in its natural state of variation. But... Um, it's no longer quite as curmudgeonly, which is a word I love saying. I, f- yeah. I feel like it was in the early 2000s, you had a lot of very um, aggressively vitriolic mm. and, and linguists were very reactive to this kind of pedantry, which was, you know, a kind of prestige marking exercise. And now I love that 
we're actually just getting out ahead of that and being really proactive about why linguistics is great instead of having to wait until someone says something very trite about usage. So that's the thing I really appreciate about the current wave and where we are in those discussions. There'll always be, you know, as long as we value the kind of knowledge worker um, focus on on that kind of tech, like writing as a as a technical exercise, there will always be people who ex- overextend their prescriptiveness. Obviously, if you're, you know, I want my copy editor when they're reviewing a journal article to be incredibly prescriptive for me uh, in terms of particular style features. But when that's used as a way of kind of beating down on a class of people for the way they speak, that's when I, I don't think it has a place. I mean, I hang around with translators quite a bit um i've just left last may i just left the board of my national association of translators and interpreters and there there was a running joke like you know if you say the word oxford common a room full of translators just start a civil war but even there there's an awareness that they're always writing for an audience and you get discussions now about what does it mean to write for this audience rather than this one uh with i'm very aware when i'm interpreting you know who is it that's listening as well as who's speaking and it, it's really amazing to see this kind of wave of interest in linguistics where people are at, who outside of the language bubble are taking an interest in where what does it mean if i'm writing for children and i'm writing for adults and then what does it mean it, what, what difference does all this make and to get people who had probably maybe couldn't even tell you anything about language five minutes before suddenly go actually i want to, to think through this is really helpful because I think the more people learn about linguistics and language change and language variation, the less kind of stuck to their guns they get. And that links to a whole load of other wider social issues that we have going on anyway. Mm. Sarah, do you remember why you wanted to study linguistics? What was the, uh, well, what was the motivation? Uh, I had to. <laughs> <laughs> Did your parents Did tell you too? Afterwards, I chose. No, I uh, I studied German and English for my bachelor's degree. And as part of the basic courses, uh, you had um, literature, uh, history of the language and linguistics in both. And I thought I was going to love the first two, literature and history of the language, which I actually didn't find too interesting in the end. Except, yeah, history of the language was very interesting as well. Mm. But, and I love literature, but I guess sometimes it depends a bit on the teacher as well, like they say. And um, I had two amazing linguistics teachers, both for English and for German. And they just made it come to life for me. It was crazy. I got so into it. I had a class um, on phonetics and phonology that I thought was not going to be my thing at all. But then my teacher, she was... American, but had gone to a British boarding school and later on married a German. So she could do all the different Amazing. For those, all the different <laughs> accents. And it was like a yeah. comedy show every lecture. Uh, but <laughs> we also way. learned a lot. Exactly. So it wasn't, you know, uh, in a bad way, but things stick, I guess, they're more appealing as well. Sure. Um, and I just got so into it on both sides and uh, like in German and in English. And like I said, I later on switched my major to linguistics did all my finals in it, um, wrote my thesis in it, and even did an experiment, which I didn't have to, but I got so curious. I did one about audience-directed speech in children. Um, that was really cool. Uh, I know. I, I, I still love talking about linguistics all the time, and my husband is sick of it, you know, that, <laughs> that kind of level. <laughs> He's not a I got turned too. over completely to the other yeah. side. <laughs> it's so great when people get to learn linguistics as part of their language learning. And I think being a linguist has made me not necessarily a better language learner, but a more happy language learner. Um, It just makes me really sad when that opportunity is squandered because they don't have the best teacher or they're not given the kind of a a good reason for for doing this learning. So it makes me happy that you had a good experience. Thank you. Yeah, I was so impressed, like on so many different levels, just how much it offers and I feel like, yeah, it gets a bad rep maybe before that it's really, you know, stiff and, mm. you know, yeah. but it's actually so alive because it's, for me anyway, it was so much about uh, people and it ta- I'm curious about cultures and all that anyway. So I had such ties and I loved, for example, one of my uh, German linguistics teachers, she was a very well known, high up kind of professor. And um, when she talked about, 
you know, the typical conversations, I don't know, Alex, in, in Germany sp specifically, they always talk about um, that the, the influence of English is ruining the German language and stuff like that. And everyone's outraged. Yeah, we're a bit like the French that way. <laughs> and she, were, like, she, but also the other professors were not concerned whatsoever, you know, so, <laughs> because they just know it's part of what happens with language? Language languages change. live, they get influenced by other languages, it's normal. You know, once, like in the episode in your podcast, I listened to it, yeah. um, Lauren, with the, the kids aren't ruining the language, you know? Yeah, I mean, there are two things that are happening here is that languages influencing each other is a is the way language works and there's a long history of it. But a lot of the time when there is this moral panic around you know, kids ruining the language because they're being badly influenced by America. You know, a lot of those features often aren't influences from America. You know, a lot of a lot of the words that my parents were like, don't use those words, they're American. They actually have a long history in Australian English. Um, and so I always think it must be very disappointing to be a kind of pedant or a really militant prescriptivist because you're giving yourself all this unnecessary stress and anxiety in life. Whereas, um, you know, I I have a lot of joy in in looking at variation in the world's language, and uh, it's just a it's just a happier approach to take for your own mental well being. I was just gonna say, isn't it so much? Doesn't it give you so much more joy as well? You know, it takes some of the fun away other ways too that comes with this whole like terrain of opportunities i guess when languages evolve and what that means and yeah definitely. Well, it's, it's as a scotsman the number of conversations that i've had with people over the word gotten actually not being an americanism <laughs> and being yeah. scottish since i was a wee boy on my daddy's knee um and it i mean i i laugh at people you know it's like you know you don't have a british accent it's like well what is a British accent, and yeah, it, <laughs> it's it when you realize that languages just change and they you know pick up influences from here, there, and everywhere, it is much more relaxing. I mean, okay, I think uh, everyone has their own little prescriptivist secrets that they don't like to let on about things that you can't stand hearing. <laughs> Fair. I think that's okay for you to have them as long as you don't impose them on yeah. other people. I would say the one the one time I will push back, and I think it's always important to say there is the kind of language change that we see that's kind of inevitable and part of a larger global story of you know how the world is changing. Um, I think it's always important to push back when people are being forced to change their language for social or economic pressures. Um, it really annoys me when we see a lot of the literature on kind of language death as though that death is not happening because of forces upon the speakers. You know, it's always like speakers have a choice. It's like, well, if it's a choice between maintaining language transmission to your children or receiving an education that's going to let you get a better job, um, you know, I don't think that's hmm. as inevitable as it as people make it sound. And, you know, I always love talking to interpreters about this because I'm like, you know, imagine a world where there were more interpreters. Like, for me, that's a great world where we have... For us too. You know, I, I, yeah, I want to see a world where, you know, we could have students coming to my classes in uh, who, who are happy to have their first language delivered through an interpreter and increase the number of people who can kind of participate in a single event. Um, but people get very anxious about it. Does that happen at all? I mean, did, for example, with, with sign language or with, I don't know, Maori or one of the other uh, sort of indigenous languages or, I mean, in, in your lectures? or The Australian and New Zealand contexts are very different in that um, in Australia you have um, anywhere between two and 400 languages um, that have been spoken uh, in Australia and a lot of those are no longer um, as vital because of the influence of colonisation. Um, and there's also, for some communities, and completely understandably, a reluctance to share their language with outsiders because why would you share your language with a group of people who've tried to destroy it? Um, in New Zealand, there's a larger consensus around you know, Maori is more or less, I, I'm sure there's a lot of internal variation that I'm not aware of, but Maori is a national language because there is only one language in this nation. And so they're able to provide more 
and more consistent materials for Maori speakers. Um, and they've spent a lot of time and energy trying to grow the number of Maori speakers. I would love to see um, th- there are some classes in Australian languages. You can take a class in Gamilaroi at the University of Sydney, which is really cool. Um, but we're not there yet. And um, Auslan is our national sign language. I would love to see more Auslan visible. Um, sadly, we're seeing a lot of it at the moment because a lot of the emergency broadcasts around the bushfires have interpretation, th- uh, thankfully. But I, I would love to see more, personally, as someone who has learned a bit and would love to learn more. My, my internal examiner for my PhD was our head of department at the time, who is Jemaine Napier, who's a Brit who lived in Australia for a while and mm-hmm. is a sign language interpreter with Auslan and BSL as well. Um, and it's amazing how, again, it seems to be there's like charisma thing that happens when you get people who are going to push something because she's interpreted several times for the for Australian prime ministers. And there seems to be something about, I hate to say it, but it seems like some languages seem to need celebrities in quotes for the rest of the world to see what was already there. I mean, Auslan's been going for a long time and it's suddenly people take an interest just because there's a person rather than just because look there's a whole language and a whole culture for you to discover yeah i think it it speaks to a larger issue that linguistics and linguistic diversity has that we need we need to be good pr people for what we believe in um and that is why as sarah said you know talking to people about linguistics all the time is a really great thing because the more people are normalized to the fact that you know, having an interpreter at big events for your national sign language is a good thing, then, um, you know, you kind of start to normalise stuff. I you know this company in Australia called 2M Language Services. They're based in Queensland. And mm-hmm. they, for example, I think for the Queensland government, they're the only provider, uh, interpreting provider for Indigenous languages. I don't know how many Indigenous languages they cover, um, but, yeah, they provide interpreting services there and it's only really a small percentage of their business but it's really close to the heart of the founder of the company because she um, when she first came to Australia she did a lot of work with uh, indigenous people and uh, they for example also use video remote interpreting now to sometimes uh, provide interpreting because I said sometimes it's really hard to get to certain remote locations or the one interpreter that exists is completely like on the other side and yeah. so it's I mean I know it's a long way to go but I think it's great that there's um, an initiative like that. Yeah and there's also I mean a big problem we have in Australia is that a lot of Indigenous people are often not often in, offered interpreters because a lot of Indigenous Australians speak Creole, which is an Australian Creole language, but it's K-R-I-O-L, mm-hmm. um, because it sounds like English a bit because it has a lot of the same words. Um, you see again and again in medical and in legal situations, people aren't offered or provided interpreters um, because of a complete lack of awareness Um I, I, I will go with the the op- optimistic idea that it's a lack of awareness and not um, a lack of caring. Um, so we, get, we have a, a lot of work to do in Australia around that. I think it is, it's interesting when you get something that becomes a national language. So in Scotland, we technically have three. Um, and there's a big difference between recognition. Isn't... Just to remind us work quickly for those who don't know. Jonathan. Yeah, so it's... Um, uh, English, Gaelic, and BSL in, in Scotland are the, the three national languages. But there's a gap between... So there seems to be stages of this is a language, this is a language that matters, this is a national language, okay, we'll do something. And I almost now wonder about what it means to have to give languages the status of a national language because surely if people in a country are using a language it's a language that we should be recognising and giving status to. And it almost feels like this kind of almost um, looking down on languages sometimes when we say this is a national language, this this isn't. You know, this is is important, this isn't. Um, And it doesn't feel, it it feels like you just create, you know, you have an in-club and an out-club of these are the real languages, these aren't. Um, And I imagine in countries where you have hundreds of languages that are spoken, that becomes an even bigger issue. 
Uh, yeah, certain, I mean, there's certainly logistical and symbolic issues, and but there is a larger cultural issue. We talk a lot um, in Australian linguistics about the issue we have with the monolingual mindset in Australia. People are just so entrenched in the idea that everyone speaks English in this country um, that it really is a missed opportunity in terms of um, kind of recognising and fostering uh, the, the really rich diversity that we have here. You know, we have some uh, linguists working with um, South Sudanese communities um, who are some of the only people outside of um, South Sudan who speak their languages in, in large groups. Um, and um, But, you know, those communities are often concerned with integrating and that that's a really sad opportunity sometimes that we don't get to celebrate. But I'm glad we're getting to that topic because this this is, I think, sort of where interpreting and, and linguistics sort of meets and, and overlaps to sort of deciding on what, what is an actual language and uh, what are important languages and, and so on. So um, because that then also leads to, to, to other things um, which um, we were going to talk about in terms of technology, language technology um, and sort of the, the corpora that are available for certain languages because um, sort of the supposedly smaller a language is, the more difficult I think it is to exist in a in the digital age, I think I think Sarah, you've done some research as well on um, sort of the languages that get um, that that are part of uh, automatic translation or machine translation, for example, um, which, as we know, works sort of quite well for English and maybe Spanish and other big languages, but not so well, or is even non-existent for supposedly smaller languages. I don't know if you if you can say something about that as well. Yeah, I don't remember ex any exact uh, statistics now about that, but definitely at NIMSI we've looked into um, topics like that. Yeah, where, for example, it's also a big missed opportunity if um, anyone really who has a website uh, only offers it in English or their native language, or especially if you have a business and you want to expand into another country and you go, oh, well, they probably understand. Then Everybody speaks you know, English. Yeah. yeah, it's a really missed up. But we, we sometimes forget about that, that so much of the internet is in English or after English than the other, you know, big dominant languages. But that there are so, so many other languages in such a large population that would be like that, that always has to read content or almost always has to read content uh, in a native that is not the, in a language that's not their native language. And uh, first of all, that is just something we need to think about and acknowledge. And then, of course, there's the um, buyer con consumer kind of side as well, where you can significantly also, of course, increase your profits if you offer whatever your service or product is in someone's native language. Um, we talk about, like, Nimsy, we kind of call it like the underwear effect or something like when you're <laughs> Do sitting explain. at home. <laughs> what is that? In your, well, you might say, yeah, I'm totally fine. Like, okay, I'm, I'm German. And I go, hey, I, um, I don't mind reading content in English all day. No problem. I, I can go to conferences and speak in English and la, 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 la. But when I'm at home in my underwear, theoretically, oh, um, then I just want to read content in my own language. Okay. That's kind of the underwear effect. Yeah. That, I'm not saying that that applies to me now because I've been living in an English speaking country for a long time that it feels okay to read English in my underwear. But theoretically, that is the idea that when people sure. are at their most private, they just want to have things in their own language as well in their own home and the privacy. Yeah, there's, there's a commercial aspect and there's also the, the power aspect. You, I have come across business people who are uncomfortable with the idea of having content in another language be, because they somehow feel like they would lose control. And I'm, and I know linguists probably could tell me, you, Lauren, you could probably tell me more about this than I could possibly know right now, but there's a very tight connection between language use and power especially when it comes to enforced language use or, you know, people who, who get to say, you know, a, a company making drugs might say, well, we're only going to write the leaflets in this language. And they might say it's commercial, but it's a power play as well. And realising this tight link between the languages that get used 
and commercial forces and power, I'm only now just beginning to appreciate how tight those links are and how meaningful those links are as well. I always think about, uh, it's always interesting when I hang out with groups of friends who um, have a diverse linguistic repertoire between them who might all speak you know, a different language or at least have learnt different languages over the years or lived in countries where they don't speak the dominant language fluently. Um, and then I compare that to hanging out with friends and family who've predominantly grown up with just exposure to English and how how much anxiety those people have when we're, you know, travelling and they don't understand everything that's being said and they suddenly decide everyone's talking about them or they find it very frustrating to do basic things. And I think that's part of that power and just being used to being able to access everything and they find it an affront sometimes that they can't. And so that's part of educating people as you know, leading, a, there's, you know, your multilingual life and then there's the kind of multilingual society that you live in um, and it's okay for your language repertoire to not fully overlap with um, your business's repertoire or your country's. Um, but that's that's a lot for people who've grown up expecting everything to be available to them to have to reconsider. I feel like... Uh, for me, so I've been living in Ireland for eight years now, but I come from uh, Western Germany. So I grew up um, and it wasn't far for me. Like I didn't need to drive long before I was in a place where nobody spoke my language, where there was like, you know, all these other countries. So my mm -hmm. family loved to travel a lot. And so we were kind of used to getting by on the little bits of whatever language we had. This is kind of how I grew up. Mm. And then I moved to Ireland and it's, uh, it's not a monolingual society, but the majority speak only English. And it, it was really interesting for me to see as well the, the way people approach travel or uh, yeah, communication with other people. Like when the company I first worked in, we were a lot of Germans and we were told we weren't even allowed to speak German on our lunch break to each other. Um, oh, wow. Wow. And I mean, as soon as an English person a person joined we would switch to English anyway so it was just like hey can you grab me a sandwich or something you know we weren't allowed to say that in German or just some comments like um, one of my friends recently got back from Portugal and she said oh it was beautiful in the south but hardly anyone there spoke English and I was like well yeah it's Portugal <laughs> you <expect her. laughs> like, yeah. why would everyone there speak English so, yeah. uh, or when I told people that when my husband and I were going to move to Germany this year and that he needs to increase his German. It's not on the level yet for certain types of work. And people were like, oh, really? You have to speak German? It's like, <laughs> yeah, we're moving to Germany. And I know lots of people there speak English. But, I mean, if you want to, for example, I don't know, teach uh, children or he's a musician, he might go into teaching and like have oh. that kind of level, you know, not like Germans will not understand that, not your average Joe or Jane. I don't know. <laughs> That's just, exactly. But it was just weird to me that people didn't even, that there was a shock to them almost or like a surprise that, oh, he has to learn another language. It's like, yeah. And, and people treat you in mono, in Scotland's technically not a monolingual country, but for all intents and purposes, in, in many ways it is. People say to you, oh, you, you speak another language? Switchcraft. Yes. <laughs> How did you do that? Because like... <laughs> it, it, yeah. But I think it is this. I don't know if it's just an English speaker myth or something that somehow. I don't think it is. Yeah, it's kind of like if you speak another language, you must be amazing, or you get um, someone. I was, someone said, "How many languages do you speak?" So I told them, and they went, "Oh, you only speak English and French." Then I'm like, "So how many do you speak?" Anyway, I'm going to get a coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, in interpreter circles, it's the opposite. Oh, <laughs> yeah. But that's the question, right? I mean, how do we, you know, do, how do you change that mindset? And how do you, how can you make sure that people are more comfortable with the fact that there are more languages, that there are several languages out there and that it's, that it's okay if people speak a language on the subway that you don't understand or at the coffee shop? I mean, that's that's the that's a big question, right? I don't know if they've, if there's mandatory a... semester abroad in a country where they don't speak <laughs> yeah. your language. 
Yeah, oh. mandatory introduction to cross-cultural communication mm. and a mandatory bit of time living somewhere else. It's great. That would also solve a lot of the world's uh, tension. <laughs> it is great, but not everybody can afford it. In I mean, not just in financial terms, but also, you know, another. How, d how does Australia deal with, because, you know, geographically, you're much further away from, you know, other countries, does Australia are Australian students encouraged to take a year out of the country as well? Because, uh, I mean, in the UK, it's like, you know, you're on a one-hour flight, you go, you're in a different country. Yeah. Um, I think part of the entrenchment of this monolingual mindset is that we see ourselves as quite isolated. Um, there was a really interesting kind of rhetoric that I wish we had actually fully integrated in the 90s about, you know, oh, we kind of woke up and realised that we were actually in Asia. Um, and that was interesting, not because we should learn about Asian languages and cultures for, you know, just edifying cultural interest. Um, but it, it turns out there's this whole economy right next to us that we should be exploiting. Um, and so for that reason, you suddenly had a lot of Italian teachers retraining as Indonesian teachers. Uh, my Italian teacher was my Indonesian teacher because she'd learnt a couple of years of Indonesian very briefly before uh, I started high school. And so... Um, you kind of had this this interest and then they were like, oh, it's okay, they're all learning English and we've kind of stepped back from that. So um, I, in my own family, I come from, on one side of my family, a family of immigrants. So my grandfather was from the UK and my grandmother's from Poland. And so I've always grown up with this idea that there are other countries and they don't always speak the same language. Um, and I was very keen to travel when I left high school, um, but that is not the case for everyone. And I think we can still do a lot of work on that and a lot of work on explaining or just encouraging people to learn languages for reasons other than they're compulsory on the curriculum. Even when they're compulsory, that doesn't always help. <laughs> I, I would say it's the opposite of helping in some cases, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Lauren, I, I remember you... Um, talking about that um, studying linguistic or, or at least uh, knowing something about linguistics can can also be very helpful for lots of other things in life and maybe also in in the profession were you thinking of something in in particular there or what was that sort of uh, alluding to ah so I um, as part of this one of the PR problems that linguists have is that the majority of people who get to keep being linguists do so because they stay in the academy. And so if you ask them, how can I be a linguist? They will say, well, you do your degree and then you do your honours and then you do your PhD and then you get a research position and then you get a professorship, which is just not realistic really for anyone at the moment. You know, I've been doing... Um, kind of short-term contract jobs for seven years post-PhD. Um, I'm as aware as anyone of how limited in scope the academic job market is. Um, but I had all these friends who had graduated um, from studying linguistics and had gone on to do really amazing jobs and often still drawing on a lot of their linguistic knowledge. Um, and so for the last four or five years on my blog, I have been interviewing people monthly-ish um, about their work and how linguistics has helped them in their work. And um, it's, it's very apparent to me, um, it's very apparent to, you know, the 40-something people I've talked to now that um, a lot of the skills you learn as a linguist, whether they be the analytical skills for analysing language or the cultural awareness um, skills that come from understanding how languages exist in the world, um, are really handy across a whole range of fields. I've interviewed um, interpreters and translators. Um, in fact, I found out about linguistics from um, some friends who were studying translation many years ago. They were like, oh, if you like language, you'll, you'll, like, linguistics is great. It's like looking at language, but like you're a scientist instead of a literature <laughs> studies major. And I was like, oh. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, you know, they, they did that thing that all linguists do when you get enthusiastic at a potential new linguist. And so I came home and a friend of mine was 
going to do introduction to linguistics. And I was like, well, you know what? It'd be good to hang out with her and it's in a good time in my timetable, so maybe I'll do it. I don't know. I might <laughs> like it. And uh, that was uh, many years ago and I'm still – it turns out I liked it and I just stuck with it. So, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, but I've interviewed people who work in marketing and PR, journalism, technical writers, uh, teachers, audiologists, speech pathologists, um, and, and, you know, a lot of these jobs sometimes they have very specific application of language and linguistic knowledge, and other times it's more those general skills. I'm referring here to this, this great Twitter thread you had um, a couple of weeks ago. You said that you miss um, linguistics blogs. So the, these interviews, was this sort of <laughs> part of the linguistic blogging or was this just... Uh, really that specific? one, so uh, there, there was a bit of a... a I guess I, I did it as kind of a Christmas holiday, getting myself ready for work after a year of parental leave. But there was a kind of Twitter challenge going around uh, to have a thread of 100 opinions about your chosen topic. And I was like, I reckon I have 100 linguistics opinions. <laughs> um, that one was a bit tongue in cheek because I actually met Gretchen through our mutual linguistics blogging. Uh, oh. And both of us still have our blog. She still does all things linguistic. Um, that's an almost daily updated uh, achievement there. Often just like, you know, if XKCD has posted a linguistics-themed comic, it'll go up there. Yeah. Um, Superlinguo uh, is a blog I've been writing since 2011, and uh, it's evolved as I have. Um, I now It's now like, I think of it as like an external brain. Mm. Um, sometimes I'll go and look back and be like, ah, oh, you know, I'll be like, I wonder if I've written anything about like... <laughs> emoji in relation to something and I'll go back and go, oh, look, I wrote a post. How delightful. <laughs> um, so it kind of exists as this like external memory storage for me. Um, and that's where for the last four years I've been doing that. But that was just a bit tongue in cheek because there are lots of, um, you know, Lynn Murphy used to post more regularly. Stan Kerry has a mm. beautiful language blog that he still occasionally updates. Um, there are still some great linguistics and language bloggers out there but I feel like you know I'm showing my age when I say I started <laughs> my linguistics communication outreach in the era of the blog <laughs> it's true yeah but it, I, I can I can absolutely sort of understand the, the whole external brain thing because I, I have a a website as well and sometimes I just I, I look up something because I know I wrote about it but I, I forgot about what it mm -hmm. was meanwhile and then it's good yeah. to just have that reference but do you see that sort of shifting elsewhere does it go to social media does it go to podcasting and is it is it necessarily a bad thing or is it really just just changing oh it's not a bad thing at all <laughs> uh I mean it is bla bad if you're a cranky old internet person like me who misses things like RSS and open platforms <sighs> Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I'm down with that. Though, know, yeah. <laughs> I there are some great like um, Facebook pages. I believe mm. I don't know. I'm not on Facebook. Um, there is some amazing linguistic content on Twitter. Like mm. site tweets people. It's totally legit. There's some great like thinking that happens when people tweet. Um, that makes me really happy. Uh, there's some good video content, YouTube content out there for sure. But obviously, you know, the, you know, even for starting a podcast, as you will know the kind of logistics and production upkeep uh, compared to starting a blog. You know, I'm very lucky that I got to start doing something very affordable <laughs> and uh, um, kind of much more flexible. So uh, I, don't, I don't think it's necessarily... It's just a problem with the, the shape of the internet in general and because I'm old sure. and curmudgeonly now. So. <laughs> I, I must admit I'm now running a YouTube channel that I try to update more often and I've found that it feels like a different register. So I've got, I've got two blogs, one I use to try and get clients and one is just like my kind of semi-ready scratch pad for kind of ideas that I'm working through. I, I got the idea to change it from a, a mathematician actually who kind of starts developing his ideas and blog posts and invites other people to chip in. And I'm not going at that level, but I thought there's something about just throwing a half-baked idea into the void and tweeting it to some people and say, go and 
tell me why this is wrong. And I, I don't feel that you can do that as easily on a podcast or on YouTube where you feel like everything has to be edited and nice. Yeah, more polished, yeah. Polished, whereas blogs have always been, you know, you get some people who have polished blogs, but, you know, they've always been the kind of, you know, 500 words, just get it out <laughs> and make sure there aren't any spelling mistakes and that's it. Mm. Um, and I think some of the best discussions happen when people take their half-baked, half-finished ideas and just throw them together. That's, to me, where a lot of the good thinking happens is when people are saying, I don't have to be polished, but what about this? But that used to happen on blogs, though, didn't it? I mean, yeah. people would post thoughts and then you would have more or less civilized discussions in the comments. And that that's I think that has really gone. And that's probably moved to social media and, and podcasting mostly. I don't know. You, can't, you can't, having a deep academic discussion on Twitter is really challenging. Yeah, I don't know. Would you agree with that, Lauren? <laughs> I think I would agree with Jonathan. Uh, Twitter is a really great place to find people with common interests. Um, I often, you know, find myself uh, kind of having the, the Twitter conversation and then I'll, like, have to jump to sending them a DM because I've got, like, a whole set of thoughts. And then, you know, I mean, that's essentially how Gretchen and I came to know each other was, you know, chatting like that on Twitter and then um, kind of Skyping and going, we're both really interested in, uh, you know, these kind of similar outreach ideas. Um, and that's, you know it's very much a kind of collegiality born of the internet. And I have a lot of collaborations like that. And now that I'm back in Australia and having been in Australia, it's incredibly useful to me to be able to chat to you in Europe on a podcast while also not having to leave my university. So it's pretty neat. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I love the way the internet allows us to connect if we use it thoughtfully. So I have a question. Um, sure. I know that you're ex enthusiastic about all things linguistic, but what are you? What are the topics that you're most enthusiastic about in linguistics? What are like your top, like favorite, love them forever kind of linguistics topics? Definitely uh, those Tibetan languages in Nepal. So the documentation of those and talking about documentation as a, you know, being very critical in a loving, critical way of the field in which I work. Um, you know, there's a lot of colonial legacy that we still need to unpack around the practice of the outsider linguist coming from the university into people's languages. Um, and we could probably do better ways of supporting people. I'm also very interested in linguistic data. Um, so how we manage, once we collect this language data, how are we using it in a way that best serves research and communities um, within those languages? Um, and also more broadly, uh, the kind of two things that I've spent the most time thinking about are um, the, the first is evidentiality, which is uh, so on verbs in English and most other languages that you will speak. Uh, you have the verb and it has things like the tense, so when things happened and um, that's part of the verb. In these languages, part of the verb is marking the source of your information. So there's a difference in the verb if you um, know something because you saw it or you know because it's a fact you've known for a long time, cool. um, which is a very different way to think about what a verb does um, oh, yeah. compared to how we use it. So... Uh, my PhD thesis was looking at how people use these um, strategically in conversation, you know, kind of what they actually mean and how people use them strategically. You know, if you're asking a question, um, you have to use the form that you think they're going to reply with. So you have to do a bit of extra mental calculation about, um, do I think that this person will know if there's any milk in the fridge I guess I better use the one about if they've seen it because I hope that they've seen whether or not there's milk in the fridge. That is um, wild. So that is... I wonder what that does to the world perception and kind of brain of the speaker. Yeah, I mean, we still need more better descriptions of kind of how this gets used across the world's languages. So um, even now I'm still kind of tinkering away on this topic, you know, a thesis 
PhD thesis, you write 80,000 words and it just is 80,000 words of telling you what you still need to figure out. So. <laughs> yeah, Jonathan said, yeah. Um, yes. And then my other... I know, Jonathan said it. My other area of passion, which has been, you know, way back to my honours thesis and something I love deeply is uh, studying the gestures that we use while we speak. So... Um, Again, understanding speech in a very holistic way, um, not just looking at sounds and words and structures in, in the grammar, but also looking at what co-speech gestures can tell us about language. Yeah, because isn't there, like, I know there's a lot of theories on that, but uh, most of them say that there's maybe 90% of a message is non-verbal. Uh, you're talking about Maharabian Smith, which is, <laughs> uh, yeah, like, it, it's certainly doesn't help us to ignore the gestural channel but gestures are doing in terms of like content delivery speech is obviously a very effective stream and we can communicate with obviously if you're listening to this now and you can understand what I'm saying um, we don't need gestures but if we look at what people are doing with gestures um, you're right that that thing is just kind of reminding you there's all this information there I know in those theories, it's not just about gestures, but also uh, like intonation yeah. and um, like pauses and all the other stuff that are not just the pure words that we're using, but everything else that yeah. comes so with So taking it. into account all of that um, and understanding what it says in terms of, you know, uh, what it's giving to the speaker, but also what it's telling us about what's happening in a person's head. Um is of interest to me. There's some really good research. I was in South Africa recently for a conference and there's some really good research coming out from a university in Geneva on interpreting and what co-speech gestures, how co-speech gestures help or hinder interpreters. And they're, they've got a really good experimental setup on that. And it's amazing to see how what seems to be a really obvious question can actually be quite difficult to answer well. Um, and I was going to ask, you know, I have my list of kind of the top five subjects in interpreting that I, the top five questions in interpreting I think we really need to get answers to. Have you got like a list of big questions in linguistics that you think these are ones we really could do with answering somehow? I teach a class on language and gesture and it's one of the highlights of my teaching year. Um, and I think the students must get sick of me every class just being like, you know, that's a great question. Um, we literally just don't know enough about this topic to be able to answer it. In terms of, you know, we have some pretty good research on, like, English, a couple of major European languages like Italian and German and Dutch because um, there's a major research centre located in the Netherlands for this stuff. Um, and then, you know, a few other languages. Uh, we just really don't know a lot about how most of the people in the world use gesture with speech and it, you know, even on that fundamental level, we're still doing a lot of catch up. Um, but I'd like to see more of an understanding of um, the kind of variation across languages, um, how that differs to the variation across people and, um, you know, in, in more linguistically rich contexts than just monolingual American speak English speakers or monolingual Japanese speakers. We're getting there, but slowly. Yeah, and and uh, maybe to sort of get to to another top another topic before we sort of slowly wrap up. I'm I'm wondering how much you work or sort of um, read about or learn about sort of technology, AI, machine learning. Does that does that play a role at all in? sort of your line of linguistics and linguistics in general, because it certainly is something that sort of keeps interpreters and translators up at night, as you can imagine. Jonathan just actually just published a book about um, interpreters and, and the future of interpreting in the age of AI. So I'm wondering if, if that's something that sort of is on your mind. I can see why it would be very anxiety inducing for Jonathan. I kind of have the opposite perspective where I work with languages where we just have insufficient data. No one is going to, and no, no computer is going to be able to do what, you know, the Star Trek universal translator does anytime soon. And I spend a lot of time yelling at the screen when we watch Star Trek, because I'm like, <laughs> that's just not going to work. You can't possibly extrapolate the whole languages from, for the whole language from those three sentences. 
Yeah, that's um, a good topic for Twitter, though, the, the <laughs> fandom and, you know, how realistic is it? Yeah, well, for I, sure. I, I, um, I but I think it's... On that. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the kinds of English speakers who are going to use machine translation are the kinds of people who are probably never going to pay for interpreters anyway because they're going to be happy with junk out. And um, when I look at the kind of work that interpreters and translators do, or even just, you know, even just in one language and English, like a relatively um, simple case of transcribing the episodes of Lingthusiasm, we still pay a person to do that because um, it is it, it is getting better. Um, but, you know, Gretchen and I speak not too far from dominant varieties of English and absolutely can't cope with it. Um, especially with domain-specific words in linguistics. So I personally feel, I don't feel concerned about the AI itself. I feel concerned about how it's being messaged and the complacency that speakers of dominant languages are going to have around believing that they can just plug in a, like, Google Translate button on their website. Yeah. Um, but to be honest, I don't think those people were going to pay good money for... They, they don't understand the opportunities they're missing yeah. out on anyway. Yeah. So um, I think it's more important for us to educate people about that and mm-hmm. the biases that are in AI, the really gross biases that really um, stop people with even slightly non-normative accents accessing AI. <laughs> I'm sure the Scottish person there will agree with me. So I, I, I tell people the story that um, because I'm aware that sign language interpreters watch the videos on my YouTube channel, I use mm-hmm. YouTube's transcription and then go through and tidy it up because it's quicker than me trying to code it and I don't understand how to do subtitles myself. That's fair enough. One of the ongoing problems, one, it can't recognise my surname, which is fine. Surnames are surnames. But quite often when I finish every video with, I'm Jonathan Downey and this is Inside Interpreting, more often than not, YouTube will say, I'm Jonathan Danny, and this is Insane Insurrection. <laughs> and th- there was one particular early episode where it seemed like every second transcription error was making me sound like a terrorist. And I was oh, yeah. waiting for the FBI to beat down my door. And I'm like, guys, I'm talking about accuracy and in interpreting, not accuracy in bombs. Mm. <laughs> I mean, you wonder what data YouTube is trained on, that that's what they Mm. think the default likelihood is. Part of that bias issue. Maybe they've just heard a lot of Scotsmen. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Scottish and automatic voice recognition is is a whole chapter unto itself, I guess. At least... Yeah, isn't that a well-known sketch? With in the, the elevator, yeah. Elevator. Well, the, the, I, I, I write a story in the book. My wife is English and is not far from quite close to a dominant variety of English. And for up until very, very recently, I've stopped phoning phone lines because who does that anymore? But whenever we had the phone, like, you know, a utility company or someone else, and they had one of these automated systems, none of these systems could understand me saying the word yes. <laughs> you know, they could get my address, no problem at all. They could get, you know, what is your complaint about? But when they would read it back and say, is this correct? And I would say, yes. It would go, is this correct? <laughs> yes. yes. And one time after like the fifth attempt at saying yes, I just handed it to my wife who spoke sweetly into the phone and said, yes. And it was completely fine after that. Yeah. And it's like, you know, it, so for, for a while my joke was that she was my um, Scottish to English interpreter. It must have been waiting for an eye from you. <laughs> okay. Um, so to wrap up, um, Lauren, I was wondering if you could recommend maybe a few episodes from the podcast or maybe some posts um, from your blog as well that will be particularly interesting for interpreters and translators. And for example, the I think that was the most recent episode of Lingthusiasm on... I think it's called Rebalancing a Lopsided Conversation, which I really enjoyed because I'm very interested in turn-taking and you sort of took apart the whole sort of how turn-taking takes place and how conversation management can happen and how sort of people, how, how you can yeah, rebalance a conversation with somebody who's very dominant in a conversation, for example. So um, if, if you can think of any um, episodes that would be interesting for interpreters or maybe your favorite episodes, I, I know that's hard to say, but, you know, just just <laughs> to leave people with a few favorite. recommendations. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, the one on uh, turn taking is really interesting because it's one of those things I remember learning when I was doing discourse analysis, and I was just like, the, the professor's just up the front of the room. I'm like, this explains almost every difficult conversation I've had in my life. Like, it's I. This is the thing that kind of frustrates me sometimes when we get so focused on just teaching within the academy. It's just like if we just knew that there were people who want to have more space between turns and there are people who see it as a positive thing to overlap a lot, um, you know, that could explain, that could help people understand why they find some people so stressful to talk to. Um, And these are the kind of things that I wish more people knew. Um, I, I I th- we did a lot of stuff in episode 18 um, about translating untranslatable words. We love those, um, don't we, Jonathan? Which is something <laughs> that interpreters and translators have lots of opinions about as well. Yes. And the kind of, you know, the flip side of English speakers being very obsessed with being monolingual is that they get very fetishistic, fetishizing mm-hmm. about um other language varieties and so we tried to unpack kind of what's happening there and um that just because you can't translate something into a single lexical item doesn't mean it's untranslatable because often these untranslatable words come with quite elegant translations Um, (laughs) i I wrote a blog post on my business blog once called everything you need to know about untranslatable words and i set it up so the first line was just they don't exist and I was this close to putting the read more button under that sentence. And I was like, nah, that'd be a bit too much. But I explained to her, you know, like no interpreter that I've ever worked with would come across a word and kind of run out of the booth screaming that they can't translate it, or at least they wouldn't do it twice. Um, and it's, yeah, it is this kind of fetishistic thing of we don't have this word in English. It's like, yeah, we don't have a lot of words in English. We just borrow them. That's what English does. <laughs> English isn't a yeah. language, it's what happens when 10 languages get thrown together. Yeah. Well, because in the end as well, you can, well, and this takes it maybe a little further with how languages are built. Mm-hmm. You know, some have like maybe more complex grammar, the others have more sounds that they work with and, and things. But I remember from my linguistics class as well, we were kind of told like, in the end, you're always able to express all of it in every language yes you might have of course specific cultural things that the other uh, culture doesn't have and like you can still explain it and you know make something out of it but it's more like what you your language might be lacking in this section it's making up in this section and you know there's always ways to come back to it basically yeah for certain and you know otherwise we just borrow a word so you know we've got lots of strategies and then i guess the other important one for um you know interpreters in you know it's good marketing for you is our first episode on um speaking a single language won't bring about world peace in yes. fact <laughs> just more translators and interpreters would bring about world peace more understanding of multilingualism would bring about world peace uh far more efficiently than trying to get everyone to speak the same language it would be a bit boring